Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Fool, And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got a great guest for you this week, Mark Coker from Smashwords, who I'm sure you guys all know, but uh, just in case you haven't heard, he founded Smashwords in 2008 to make it a fast, free, and easy way for any writer anywhere in the world to self-publish an ebook. Today, Smashwords works with, a, with over 130,000 authors and in small independent presses around the world that publish and distribute nearly 500,000 books. Mark is a contributing commu- communist. communist. <laughs> I just, yeah. I knew I'd mess it up, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Columnist. Oh, man, that's awesome. <laughs> Columnist. I've been called worse. <laughs> for Publishers Weekly, and he's also the host of the new Smart Author pod- podcast. I don't think I can recover from that. Um, he also does an annual survey based on all the book sales that go through Smashwords to iTunes, Apple, Kobo, and other retailers. So he's got his hands on a lot of interesting data, and we're going to ask him about that. Um, Mark, welcome to the show. Sorry Hello, comrades. <laughs> oh, it's, Hi. Mark was actually on about uh, three years ago. We had him on episode 25. So I guess we should start out asking what's new with you and Smashwords in the last three years. Oh, gosh. A lot, a lot, a lot has changed. A lot is new. And, and some things are the same. Um, I think the last time I was on the show, we talked a lot about pre-orders and um, talked about how pre-orders could help authors sell a lot more books. And based on our initial data back then, um, books released as pre-orders were selling more books than books that weren't released as pre-orders. I think what we've seen over the last two, three years is more evidence, strong evidence that the the authors who are releasing their books as pre-orders are really vacuuming up the lion's share of the sales. Awesome. I've actually been listening to your podcast and uh, you did oh. one on pre-orders and the uh, the survey data. And I, I promptly went and put up a pre-order for a book I know I have coming up out in April. So you inspired <laughs> at least one person. Yeah. There. You know, one, one thing that was really interesting in the latest survey is, you know, we looked for the first time, we looked at pre-order adoption rates across the different genres. And um, so we looked at during this 12 month survey period, we found that 19% of the fantasy titles that were released during this period were released as a pre-order, yet that 19% accounted for 59% of that category's sales for the entire year. Um, and when we looked at sci-fi, 15% released as a pre-order, accounting for 43% of that category's sales. So I think the evidence is pretty strong. If, if an author isn't releasing their book as a pre-order, they're really leaving money on the table, leaving readers on the table. Uh, you know, we also found that only about 12, 13% of authors are using pre-orders now. So uh, that was really fascinating. We've got this small minority of authors that are totally outperforming everyone else. Uh, and pre-orders seem to be a, 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 common, a common link there. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder how many people are really think ahead with planning their catalogs and re- releases for the coming year. And how many people are like, I, I plan ahead, but oftentimes <laughs> I just, I want to release it as soon as I'm ready. Uh, it is great that you don't require the manuscript to be ready. Cause I, I haven't even started writing that book. I'm <laughs> going to yeah. release in April. Yeah. Well, I, I encourage everyone to, you know, look at your calendar for the next 12 months. What do you plan to release in the next 12 months? Get it up on pre-order. Now you can always modify the release date at any time. Um, and you know, obviously, you want to rele- you want to modify the release date as far in advance as possible, so that you don't disappoint your readers. Um, but for professional indies who um, can be disciplined about it, uh, it's really the best way to run your business because every single time you're out there promoting your new release, you've got the next title on pre-order, and you're promoting it as well. Um, so you get higher attach rates, uh, you know, helping the readers move from one book to the next. Do you think uh, some of the success is just the fact that your book is out there for months and people can find it? Or does it do all those pre-orders kind of count and help the ranking uh, at the release day? Um, well, I don't know if you got to the episode of Smart Author on pre-orders yet. Um, but in that episode, I, I itemized, I think, six different benefits of pre-orders. Um, so obviously at iBooks, you know, all those accumulated orders credit toward your first day's sales rank. 
So that's a huge advantage at the world's second largest bookseller. But at all the retailers, there are a lot of other advantages to doing pre-orders. Um, and I, part of it is just having that, being on that shelf longer, being discoverable longer. You've got more selling days. You know, if you've got your pre-order up 12 months in advance, you're, the retailer is advertising your book to everyone who crosses your, your author page or looking at any of your other books. They're advertising your book for 12 more months. Um, as you're out there on social media, uh, you know, communicating with your readers about your works in progress, you're, out th you're marketing your book in advance. And if you don't have that pre-order link, you have no way to capture that order at the moment you've got their greatest attention and interest. Um, it also shows commitment um, to the reader that, you, that, you're, that you've got more books coming. If you write series, it shows commitment to a series that there's always a book on pre-order coming next. And, you know, you have the opportunity at, when the reader finishes the end of, you know, the last book in your, your current series, they can, you can advertise that you've got the next book in the series coming out. So um, you can keep them, keep them on your train, selling the ticket in advance. All right. Now, um, there's different places uh, handle pre-orders in different ways. Like a lot of them, particularly a lot of the ones that Smashwords goes through, apply uh, pre-order sales as day one sales. So it's a huge rank boost. Uh, but others don't do that. So like pre lots of people will say that when there's not going to be a rank boost, uh, you shouldn't do a long pre-order because you're sort of cannibalizing whatever your rank is going to be for the launch. Would you say that it's worthwhile having two different launch uh, strategies for the different pre-order behaviors? You know, I think it really depends. Um, iBooks is the only retailer that gives you full credit for all those accumulated uh, sales. Uh, Barnes & Noble and Kobo, from what they tell me, um, only give you partial credit, which means there's partial cannibalization. And then at Amazon, it's, it's full cannibalization. So you, you're not getting any credit on day one to your sales rank. Um, but you do get the other advantages. So, you know, if you just take the case of Amazon where you get the least advantage, um, I think authors are still well served to do a pre-order at Amazon. You know, if you're able to take advantage of those other capabilities of a pre-order, you know, the, the longer shelf space or lo longer shelf time, um, the ability to promote it and capture orders in advance. You know, a lot of your readers want to, want to buy your next book. And if, if it's coming out in six months, they'll say, yeah, I want to buy it in six months. But if they don't have the pre-order link, a lot of those readers are going to are going to fall off and forget about it. Um, so, you know, I think I think a pre-order still makes sense at these other retailers. Yeah, and um, it's ninety days at Amazon. Is it about you guys do about a year? Is that how far out you can do them? Um, you know, we we allow them up to a year because that's the max at iBooks. Okay, great. Yeah, I've I did. You know, I set my one up there for April already through Smashwords. And then uh, as soon as I can do it 90 days out, because this is a book eight in a series for me. So I, I'm not worrying about, oh, I hope it has a good sales ranking at launch. I just want the, you know, I can, I have another series in the same world going on now. So it gives me a chance to kind of promote it at the same time. And I, I'm curious if, uh, I actually am not curious because I just forgot my train of thought. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um for those who are doing it at Amazon, do you, do you usually see people doing like maybe a shorter pre-order there than the full 90 days because they are worrying about the launch maybe being uh, cannibalized, as you said? Yeah, it, you know, for the few authors that we do distribute to Amazon, um, my sense from them is that they prefer, if they do a pre-order at all, um, they're doing a much shorter time frame, maybe a week or two, and they're only doing it to satisfy their their readers at Amazon who want a pre-order and they see that they're, you know, readers at other platforms already have the pre-order. Of the several pre-orders I've done at Amazon, that's, I think the longest one I did was 30 days. And even then, I, I, I know you guys, you know, give friendly reminders that, hey, you, you might want to, don't, don't forget about, you know, so make sure you submit the manuscript. <laughs> they are brutal about saying that and if you're going to go straight to, you know, where, if you do not do this now, now they, yeah. they're not very user friendly about it. <laughs> well, I just did a pre-order for one of our authors that uh, released a few weeks ago and we had the, you know, we were on the ball. We had the final manuscript up a month in advance and Amazon kept sending us reminders almost every week. You know, you better have the final up. You better have the final up. 
Yeah, and they weren't cheery reminders either. I know that for certain. Um, Amazon's not known for being cheery with their reminders. They're usually fire and brimstone. You do this. Otherwise, you know, we're going to kick you or whatever. They kick you all right in a very specific location, but we'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's Smashwords, you know, that's not our style. Um, if you miss your pre-order date, uh, we're not going to punish you. Uh, we don't uh, take away your pre-order privileges. Uh, what we do is if, if you fail to deliver your final manuscript, like let's say you're doing an assetless pre-order, um, we'll just automatically push back your release date a week if you don't deliver on time. And, and, and that, you know, the retailers really love that. That way the retailers are never disappointing their customers when a, when a pre-order blows up in the book because the book's not there yet. Yeah, that's, that, I, I would think that'd be the only way to do it. And a certain big name corporation should take notes from that, but we both know that they won't. <laughs> yeah, maybe they will. I'm, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, uh, even in the midst of clouds. <laughs> <clears throat> Allergies. Yeah. <laughs> I will add that my earlier thought I was going to say with Amazon is I will occasionally do the longer ones if like if I were to release a book one and it was selling really well and I want to kind of capture the interest before it fades off and <laughs> you know I think because there's a lot of people that they're maybe not super fans yet because they just ran into you but yeah. it, they'll buy the next book if it's an option to do so. Yeah if you're putting out your first in the series you've got to have the second in the series on pre-order. Otherwise, you're not gonna you're not gonna capture a lot of those first time readers. All right. Well, I'm curious. You you do a big post every New Year's on kind of your predictions and trends, what you see coming down. Would you like to share? I know you kind of had some positive ones and then some less positive ones. Would you maybe share a couple uh, of I, predictions? You know, <laughs> I, I think it was probably my darkest post ever. <laughs> and that's putting it lightly. Um, you know, I, what, what I'm seeing in the indie space um, is really the, the, the realization of um, a lot of what I predicted back in 2011, you know, with, you know, what are the long-term implications of, of KDP Select? What are the long-term implications when um, a million, over a million books are locked up at a single retailer, which means the other retailers can't sell those books, can't service those customers? What are the long-term implications of that? And you know, it, it, the, the long-term implications are, are pretty predictable. Uh, you know, you're slowly bleeding these other retailers to death um, because indie ebook authors um, uh, have become a really important uh, segment of the ebook market. And um, you know, I, I believe that indie ebook authors are going to continue to capture an ever greater share of the market. So as indies become more and more important and retailers can't sell all the books of indie ebook authors, um, they're going to slowly fade. And so that's what we're seeing. Um, and it's not the only reason that some of these re other retailers are having difficulty. Um, and that concerns me because whenever we, um, whenever you start seeing um, major retailers falling by the wayside and becoming, uh, you know, less significant factors in the marketplace, that's fewer retailers out there working for you to connect you with their customers. And it increases your dependence on a single retailer that has really monopolized the market now with probably close to 70, 80% of the market. And even if you're an author who believes in staying wide on principle, um, it still forces you to become more and more dependent upon a retailer whose very business model is dependent upon extracting ever greater margin from their producers. And as the author, you are the producer. So, um, you know, I think, I think those storm clouds are starting to become more and more apparent to authors and, um, I know a lot of authors are starting to feel uh, quite helpless and distraught. Um, I, I talk with a lot of authors who feel like they have to be there. They have to be exclusive. Otherwise, they can't put food on their family's table. And it's, it's, really, it's really sad to me to hear that. And I, and I totally understand the position these authors are in. Um, you know, I... 
you know, there was a, a lively discussion at the blog on this topic. It was probably a little less lively than it was in prior years. In prior years, whenever I spoke out about exclusivity, um, you know, I got a million arrows in my back for it. Um, but there, there were still some people here who, you know, there are a lot of people, they don't, they, they feel like they've got to do what's right for them. And uh, nobody out there should be telling them what's right for them. And I agree with that. But I think we all also need to recognize that every one of us individually have a collective impact with the decisions that we make. You know, if, if we abuse our environment, eventually the environment is going to have its revenge on us. You know, many great civilizations, the Mayan civilization, the Incas or whoever, you know, they, once their environment was wasted, they collapsed. And, and, and so we're, we're in a, a, a precarious situation here where, um, you know, authors have become dependent. And, and so the, the question I raised in the predictions post was, are, you know, are indie authors losing their independence? And, and, I, and I think the answer is yes. And, and, I, and I, I, don't, I don't yet see um, how that boat turns around because, um, you know, authors are born desperate to reach readers. That's why we write. You know, there's satisfaction, there's personal satisfaction in writing and publishing, but if we want to do it professionally, then we need to reach readers. And and some and it forces us to sometimes make short-term decisions that aren't in our long-term best interest. You know, I'm I'm working with an author now who's been exclusive for a long time, and now he's trying to break out wide. And he's starting at ground zero. And you know, I don't care if you've sold a million books previously. You know, to the wide audience, you've been gone. They've forgotten about you, and and, and it's gonna t- it's gonna take a, w- a long time to rebuild. Um, but you know, for the uh, you know for authors such as you guys, who've been wide and maintained that wide stance, you're in a much better position. You're more diversified. So I, I mean, it, it's good for the authors that have that have um, you know stayed wide and developed a, a broad readership across multiple platforms. But I, I, I'm really concerned about the authors um, who are overly dependent on that one retailer. So that, that you know that so that kind of colors what I'm seeing for 2018. Um, you know, on the on the bright spots, I think um, you know I'm really excited about what's happening with audiobooks. I think audiobooks are creating more time for readers to enjoy books, um, and, and so that's a real positive, because you know books as a media form are competing against all other forms of media. And, and, you know, you can take Amazon out of the, the equation and let's say, you know, Apple, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, and every other retailer is doing wonderful and it's all, all a bed of roses. The book industry is, is still facing these macro threats from alternative media forms that, that consume our time for uh, our media time for information and entertainment. Books are just one form of, of doing that. So audiobooks, I, I think, are really great. Um, and, you know, they're the fastest growing segment in publishing today, I think. And I think they're going to continue to be strong because, you know, I, I think, you know, books have lasting value and audiobooks are going to make it possible for more people to enjoy books at times where previously they couldn't. All right. Well, it was a little doom and gloom, but, uh, you know, yeah. we, we do have a lot of people that we talk to that, um, they may be exclusive with Amazon, but they very much want to figure out how not to be so dependent. So I guess as we move into asking you some marketing tips, are there any things you're seeing like ways people can, you know, establish themselves on other platforms and also maybe bring readers and sell direct like through Patreon or through their own website? Sure. Yeah. Well, one of the, my predictions for 2018, and this is real, I mean, it's really already happening is that, you know, more and more Indies are recognizing the importance of controlling their platform. You know, we saw what happened with Facebook. Many indies jumped into Facebook, built up large followings at Facebook at great expense and great time that it took to do that. 
and then Facebook turns around and pulls a fast one and holds your audience hostage and, and you have to pay to reach your own audience. Um, so I, I think, I think, you know, Indies are starting to recognize the importance of, of controlling access to their readers um, on their own terms. Um, so obviously mailing lists, um, you know, many Indies now recognize that the mailing list is one of the most powerful tools. Yet on the flip side of that, I think we're going to start seeing a lot of mailing list fatigue. And, and unsubscribes because, you know, I think readers, readers are often enticed to join a mailing list because, you know, they get a free book or whatever. Um, and they find, they're going to find themselves with way too many subscriptions and way too many indie authors that are crowding their inbox. And then it, it's, it's going to get difficult again. You know, often a lot of these great marketing tools start losing their impact over time as indies wake up and realize that, you know, this is one of the best practices they should be implementing. Um, yeah, I've, you know, I've seen a lot of interesting stuff happening with Patreon. I don't have data on it. Um, I can't, I, I don't really know. You guys probably know more than I do. Um, you know, what a difference it's making for authors. Um, and, and, you know, the, I think we'll see more, you know, more authors trying to sell direct. Um, that, that's going to be somewhat fraught with difficulty, I think. Um, you know, I remember back, uh, boy, it was probably about eight years ago, when I, eight or nine years ago when I first met Dan Pointer, the late, great Dan Pointer. Um, he told me that he used to sell eBooks over his website, but he, although he made, he made himself really accessible to his readers, it was really upsetting to him to receive calls at 11 o'clock at night uh, on a weekend uh, from a, a frantic reader who couldn't figure out how to open up the book. You know, the support load uh, of, of caring for readers. And, you know, that's a service that retailers provide. Um, and if, if more and more of your sales are going into your own, you know, that you're, if you're selling more and more of your books direct, then you're not getting some of those other ancillary benefits of selling at a retailer, like higher sales rank, higher visibility to a larger audience. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of experimentation yet to happen there. Um, but, you know, I think the most important thing is that, that indies develop close relationships with their readers and, and, and maintain the ability to point those readers in the direction that is most beneficial to the author. I don't think I can actually think of a worse fate than trying to be on the phone all the damn time and say, I can't get my book to open. Okay, here's what you do. Click here, click here. And because there's so many different formats that are out there, but, but I have a question for you with, with regards to the audiobooks you were talking about before you see like a, a further rise of interest in that. Do you see, I mean, I, do you see any rise in popularity of the ability for the readers to read the books to you? Like, for instance, like I know that the actual Kindles can do, thus turning the book into an actual audiobook. Because I've had quite a few of my readers tell me that they really enjoy getting one of those little audio headphone cables, plug in their Kindle into their car stereo, and let's say you have a huge commute. You get to listen to that all the time there. So I'm just wondering, have you heard of anybody hopefully trying to turn their books into like something like that? Or is it just Kindle that's got the power and they're the only ones that can do it? You know, I haven't heard a lot in that regard. Um, and I, and I haven't, I haven't tried the, the Kindle version that does that. Is the voice semi-robotic? Semi-robotic. And for us fantasy authors, it, you get a good chuckle out of, since we have a lot of made up names and words there that yeah. uh, the little device trying to read it. But for the most part, you know, the gist goes through there. So. Yeah. Um, I, I could see that as a, a poor man's alternative to a professionally produced audiobook. You know, because a great audio book is going to add a lot of value if you've got a great, you know, great talent that's narrating it. Yeah, it's, it's, I just, I just figured that out. once, once I heard the first person told me that, I was like, what a novel concept. I mean, if you really want the thing to read it to you, that'd be great. You can know if you got the right audio connections, you can get it everywhere. It just, I, I noticed even on my app on, on the iPad, you can't do it. It has to be the Kindle. I'm like, do they somehow must have targeted the technology that'll let you to do it? Because as far as I hear, no one else can do it. Um, I've got to think that there's a solution out there. Um, you know, especially when you've got DRM free books, there's got to be some public domain solution that you can use out there to do automatic narration. I'm sure there is. I, I'm just not aware of it. Um, 
you know, like all disruptive technologies, the, they often start off being so horrible um, that they're almost unbearable, but they're going to get better and better over time. So what Amazon's doing is going to get better and better over time. Um, and, and eventually it will start competing uh, with professional narration. I mean, I, I do have confidence in, in how technology progresses and what Amazon can do with that. I was to say, yeah, I have confidence in you know, in the technology progressing too. I just wish that certain people didn't have <laughs> the control that they do, but I will leave it at that. <laughs> so, okay, that that answer for me on that line of questioning, anyway. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, I think next we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, the survey. So, I got a question about the survey that you just released. Um, it seems like a lot of being successful as an indie depends upon uh, the balance and how to find a genre that's selling, but isn't so saturated that it's hard to stand out in it. Based upon the data, uh, I don't know if it's the, if you've been able to make a determination, but would you say a hungry, underserved niche is a better target or an already established audience? You know, I get this question a lot, and I, I'm always tempted to push back on it. Because I think in many ways it's the wrong question. You know, unless you are such a talented writer and you can write awesome five-star books in any genre on any subject, I think you need to focus first on where are you going to write the best books and where is that common intersection between your talent and your passion? Because in, you know, as an author, and, and you guys know this and every writer knows this, this is a tough life. You know, it's, it's wonderful being able to live in our heads and write. It's a dream job. But the business of it is really tough. And every single day, you're going to you're gonna have, you're going to be assaulted by reasons to quit and, and, and reasons to feel discouraged. And if you're not finding passion in the creation of what you're doing, um, you're not going to do your best work. And, and, and you're not going to stick with it. And, and the only authors who fail are the ones who quit. And everyone else has to travel through this valley of obscurity before they achieve their success. And, and so, um, you know, when, when, you, when you look at, you know, what, what readers need today, what they're looking for, they're not looking for a good book. I mean, there, there, there's a glut of, of high quality books on the market already. So good isn't good enough anymore. Your book needs to be so super awesome. It needs to be five plus stars. So that should be your primary focus. Now, um, with that said, um, in the survey this year, we did look um, at, at, you know, within romance, we, we did you know, pick apart some of the different subgenres in romance to identify potentially underserved markets. So we looked at, um, you know, we, we added up the sales, we looked at the sales in each subgenre, we calculated, you know, the average yield per title, and then compared them to one another. And we did find some genres that looked potentially underserved, where, you know, the average or median title was selling better in that category than any other category. Um, so that tells me that 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 market is potentially not saturated. Um, as I was preparing this afternoon uh, for our conversation today, um, I took a quick look at some of the 2017 Smashwords data and uh, calculated some of the same stuff uh, for sci-fi and fantasy. And so I, I can share some of those some of those findings with you. Uh, I would caution you that these are rough, and 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 if I say that your favorite genre is, is one of the lower yielding genres, I don't want you to feel discouraged, <laughs> all right? Because a lot of authors are going to say, oh, you know, I, I'm doing, you know, whatever. What, what came out, like, pretty horribly? Hard sci-fi, all right? Our data says hard sci-fi doesn't do so well. It underperforms. Adventure sci-fi tends to underperform. Um, steampunk does well, and Lindsay, that's your fault. You're 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 skewing the data. All right, Sorry you're about that. Yeah, no, um, she's not. <laughs> she is. 
Um, well, she's one of our top performers in, in, in steampunk. Um, and you have to be really, the, the, all of this data is suspect because it only takes a few, and, 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 and Joe, you're, you're responsible for this as well. Um, it only takes a few strong performers to skew the, the data. Um, but, you know, it seems like uh, steampunk is looking good. Um, YA fantasy is looking good. What else did I come up with? Uh, romantic fantasy. So this is categorized under fiction, romance, fantasy um, is outperforming everything else in sci-fi and fantasy. Um, but, you know, if you, if you generally write sci-fi, you know, that's a big leap to move into romance. That's, that requires some special skills that, that not all of us are going to have. Um, urban fantasy, really strong uh, last year um, based on our data. Um, so, you know, th th those are some data points. Um, I've got, I did dig up some other data that I can share with you guys. Um, are you interested in, in the impact of word counts? You betcha. We were going to ask about that, so go for it. <laughs> How did I know that you were going to ask for this? Uh, um, when we looked at our top 10 uh, best-selling titles in sci-fi and fantasy, uh, the average word count, 109,000 words. When we look at our top 100 best-selling titles, um, 85,000 words. Readers prefer longer books across all the different genres, that, that if you write longer, uh, it, you, you're going to satisfy your readers more and you're more likely to show up in the bestsellers, among the bestsellers. Um, and so, you know, I looked at it, uh, gave a quick look to some of the, the data for sci-fi and fantasy. I was looking specifically at the average book length of, um, of series titles, of the best-selling series within sci-fi and fantasy. Um, and among the top 10, bestsellers, it was 109,000 words on average. And then as the sales rank drops, uh, we see the word count dropping. So there's some correlation going on there. Um, one, one of the important uh, concepts that, that I really encourage authors to think about, and, and I talk about it, this in, um, I think, episode three of the Smart Author podcast on bestseller secrets, is this concept of the, the power law curve. And, and, and how sales rank is distributed across um, all the different retailers and how it kind of looks like, see if I, that, that's kind of the chart and it kind of looks like this. So you've got a very small number of titles that sell really well and then it drops off really quickly and then you've got the long tail. And, and so among the different best practices, you want to um, adopt the best practices that are consistent. You know, what are the, 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 the habits of successful authors up in this area. What are, the, what are the best practices that travel in the same orbit as these bestsellers? And, and uh, longer books tend to be one of those universal truths uh, for uh, you know, selling more titles, achieving higher sales rank. And you know, it, it makes sense to me on a number of different levels. You know, if you're a great writer and the, the, the reader loves immersing themselves in your imaginary world, uh, the longer they spend in your world, the happier they're going to be. And the longer they're in your world, the greater your opportunity to earn their trust and loyalty and to move readers to fans and fans to super fans. All right. And going back on what you were saying earlier about how you know, it's getting difficult you know, to be an actual indie author and do all this kind of thing, my wife, who's a non-author, actually came up with a really good question once I told her who we were talking to again tonight. And, and she had essentially a question that said, well, what she wanted to know, what excites you the most about being a self-published author in this present day now? Granted, about all the things that are starting to get more and more difficult for us, what do you like the most? So this was the question that she posed to her husband? To, to me to relate to you. <laughs> okay, well, it's easy for us to um, get caught up in the doom and gloom of my 2018 predictions. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we cannot lose sight of what an awesome world it is today for indie authors. If we look back 10 years ago to where the world was 10 years ago, your opportunities today are so much 
greater, so much more amazing than they were 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you had to bow subservient to publishers and to agents. You know, 10 years ago, probably 99% of aspiring writers would never get published as an author, would never have a chance to have their books judged by readers. So in that sense, we've moved, we've progressed so much. This democratization of publishing, the democratization of retailing so that you can get your book on the same shelf, the democratization of opportunity, where it you, you, you have the opportunity to reach millions of readers. And even if, I mean, even if, uh, I'm tempted to use a nuclear bomb uh, metaphor, but I won't, um, after just experiencing our own scare here in Hawaii. Um, but, you know, even if, if the world turns really dark and the market for ebooks drops by 50%, it's still a huge multi billion dollar market. There's still an opportunity for any writer in the world to potentially reach millions of readers. Um, it just means it's more and more difficult going forward. Um, so, you know, that is exciting to me the democratization of access, the democratization of opportunity. Um, the democratization of creative expression. You know, By the way, you're saying that word very, very well. I know what the word is. Like, I don't even think I could say that that well that many times in a row without mangling it. <laughs> well, I've, I've had practice <laughs> for the last 10 years. <laughs> well, you did. It, 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 it's a word that, you know, is very close to my heart. It's why I started Smashwords. You know, I thought every writer in the world deserved the opportunity to be judged by their readers, had the opportunity to publish directly to their readers and not have to run this gauntlet of gatekeepers. Um, so that, that to me is still as exciting as ever. Um, I, I would agree. Yeah. So uh, that, that's exciting. And the, the, you know, when I talk to authors, what do you love most about self-publishing? A lot of it is just the creative control and the, the, the creative control of the writing the creative control of the publishing, of the book production, the cover design, uh, the creative control of how are you going to price today? How are you going to price tomorrow? How are you going to serve your readers? Your readers are your customers. You know, they're your partners in this journey. And it's really great that authors, indie authors today have such close relationships with their customers. And, and this is a competitive advantage that you will never lose. And it's also an opportunity for authors is to get closer to their readers uh, so that so that they're having a personal relationship with them, a one-to-many relationship. There's definitely still a lot of like opportunity out there, even though, as you said, it is more competitive and we're hearing people talking about that. But, you know, we've had data guy on too and, and talk about how many people are actually making a living income that never could have before. You know, before it was just like the top 10 bestsellers that made yeah. big money. Yeah, well, I think over the, the t almost 10 years of Smashwords, I think we've, you know, our authors have sold over $100 million worth of books at retail. I mean, that's just really cool to me. That's $100 million at retail that wouldn't have been there otherwise. So, um, yeah, it is changing people's lives. Um, and you don't have to be a bestseller for it to change your life. You know, here, here in, uh, I'm here on vacation in Hawaii, met with a, a, the, the widow of a, a, a Smashwords author who passed away uh, in the last year, um, uh, Will, William Dick, Dickinson. Dixon. Um, you know, he, he's selling a few thousand dollars a year worth of books. He's not going to hit any bestseller list, but the income that's coming in off of these books and that will continue to come in off of these books is significant and it makes a difference um, for someone's livelihood. You know, when it comes to, you know, staying in the house that you're in, you know, putting food on the table, you know, a couple hundred dollars here or there makes a really big difference. And so, you know, this, the, this indie author revolution is positively impacting, um, hundreds of thousands of writers. And, and that's really exciting and, and gratifying, I think. It also means that we've got a lot to fight for. You know, the, we've got to, we've got to, we all have to fight for 
this amazing opportunity and fight for our independence. Fight for the right for creative expression. You know, censorship comes in multiple forms. Um, you know, in, uh, I think it was that, what, the, the episode on the indie author manifesto and the smart author podcast, I looked back at censorship starting with the, introdu the introduction of the Gutenberg printing press. And it was really interesting how once writers started having free expression through the printing press, it scared people. It scared the religious authorities, it scared the political authorities, and it started this centuries long um, effort to censor and control what comes out of that printing press. And so today, um, we've got the democratized printing press through ebook publishing and ebook publishing platforms. We've got new forms of censorship coming along censorship by algorithm. And, you know, I don't think many people are thinking of it in those terms yet. You know, if you've got a retailer that is effectively putting a gun to your head and saying, if you don't make your books exclusive to us, we're going to bury you. We're going to make you less visible, less accessible to our customers. A retailer who's saying you need to pull your books from other retailers, that's a form of censorship, but no one's talking about it that way. Um, and so, you know, indie authors need to stay alert. Um, to any attempt by any power or authority to limit our opportunity to express ourselves through books. So I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> well, it's definitely something to be aware of, is that even if you're making really good money today, if it's all coming from one place, it's it's not as secure as if, you can have it from multiple different sources of income. And, and you're absolutely right that I've played with Kindle Unlimited because I'm like, well, I can't stick in the top 100 of my category without being in Kindle Unlimited. So I've certainly felt the pressure of jumping in at least to launch a book because of that. But um, let's, let me ask you about pricing because that was kind of a positive thing too, I think from your survey is you seem to find that yeah. maybe you could bump up your pricing and it wouldn't affect your sales necessarily. Yeah, so this was another uh, really big bright spot, and it was uh, encouraging to me to see this. In the prior six years surveys, um, almost every single year consistently, $299 and $399 were the sweet spots where you could maximize unit sales and maximize readership, because both are important. Well, ma maximize re readership and maximize earnings because you want to make money, but you also need to reach readers because the readers are going to sustain your career going forward. In fact, at the beginning of the survey, 299 was the sweet spot and then 399 replaced it. And, you know, there was, you know, go back and forth maybe between 299 and 399. They're both great price points. But in 2017, what we found for the first time in the six year period is that 499 uh, among our best selling authors was the sweet spot that maximized earnings and readership. And so my takeaway from that is that the indie authors who've built loyal readership have pricing power. And despite all these forces for commoditization out there in the marketplace, um, I think a lot of, um, a lot of authors with, with solid followings have the opportunity to raise their prices slightly uh, without losing much readership or without losing any readership. So it's something to experiment with. Um, you know, if you're selling well at $299 and $399, experiment with $499 for, for some books and, and see uh, how readers react to that. Um, and if you are selling, um, you know, full-length fiction at $0.99 cents or, God forbid, $1.99, $1.99 is a black hole. Don't go there. Um, try raising your prices and see what happens. You know, the great thing about, about being an indie author is that you can experiment. If, if you find that you move to 499 and your readers don't follow you there, or if they complain, um, you know, it's not a big deal. And there, there are also some ways to ease into these price spots without shocking your readership. I mean, I remember going back years now, we had, you know, New York Times bestselling authors at 99 cents, and they were reluctant to move up to 299 or 399 because they didn't want to disappoint their readers. 
Um, and what they found is that they could move to those price points. But like, here's a way, like, let's say you're at 299 and 399, you want to experiment with 499. Um, for your next book on pre-order, put it at 499 or plan for the book to be at 499, but make the pre-order 399 and then communicate to your readers. This is a special thank you. Uh, you're going to give them a dollar off if they reserve the pre-order and then it's going to its regular price of 499. Um, you know, four ninety nine is an incredible deal for full length fiction. You know, for ten, twelve, thirteen hours of entertainment, four ninety nine is a deal. So, um, you know, indie authors shouldn't sell themselves short. Right, um, and also like we're talking about higher prices. Usually, the highest prices are associated with like book collections and anthologies, like or bundles. Uh, but so. Should we be trying to calibrate the size of our bundle to fall within a price range? Or do you think that just the higher, like, do bundles sort of have their own price category? So it, we, we looked, um, there, there's a whole section in the Smashwords survey, which um, you can find on the podcast or you can find at the Smashwords blog. Just Google Smashwords survey 2017. Um, we, you know, we looked a lot at the bundles, the box sets, and the different price points. Um, what we found is that box sets are one of the habits of the most successful best-selling authors, but these box sets don't generally show up in our bestseller lists. They're rarely bestsellers. They're rarely big money makers. Um, so, you know, there are a couple different types of box sets. There's the single author box set, which is usually a value bundle. So you could put a whole series in there and maybe discount it 15, 25% to give your readers a value. And, and, you know, one of our best-selling box sets was, I think, around nineteen dollars. Um, but we had another best-selling box set that was around five ninety-nine. It was a box set of short stories. Um, you know, I, th I think every author should be doing box sets. Um, but the 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 benefit of box sets isn't necessarily the sales you get from it. I think it it, it grows your readership by making your books more accessible uh, to to different readers. Um, but I, I'm still really excited about multi-author box sets. And the pricing on multi-author box sets should be different, um, either free or 99 cents. Um, because the, the, the goal of a multi-author box set is the collaborative marketing, you know, the, the amplified marketing reach that you get. If you're in a box set with 10 other authors, you've got nine other authors promoting your author brand. Um, you know, if you do, if you write series in say, you know, uh, sci-fi. Let's say you write sci-fi series and you've got a free series starter. Get together with a bunch of uh, fellow sci-fi writers who are targeting the same audience and do a bundle of, um, of free series starters. You're not losing anything. You've already got a free series starter. Great opportunity to, to collaborate on the marketing. All right. So I was going to ask you too, with regards to pricing, do you subscribe to the notion that ebooks priced three ninety nine or higher sell better than those priced at ninety nine cents because readers think that quality books shouldn't be priced that low. So um, that is a great question, and it's another topic that uh, is fresh in my mind because one of my recent episodes just talked about that. Um, it might have been the best practices episode, episode three. Um, ba basically, my my view of this. The answer to this is that it depends. Um, readers um, have different pricing prejudices. Every reader does. And, and it's, it's dangerous to say, well, all readers are going to react this one way because readers react differently. Uh, you will have readers that, that are not going to try you. They're not going to try any book from you because they don't know you. They don't know your brand. They don't trust you. They don't know you. So they're not going to buy you. And, and so some of these readers, if they're interested in you at all, maybe they're only going to try you if the book is free. But other, other, other readers won't try books at free because they think it's a cheap book. Or they won't try 99-cent books or two 99-cent books because they think they're cheap. Some readers will only try the author if they're at a higher price point. Uh, I think the answer to this is, and the, for, for indie authors, is if you're publishing multiple books, and you should, Occupy multiple price points. This way, um, when the reader, you know, runs across your book, 
you will still satisfy their their um, their prejudice. You know, if if they're only interested in in five ninety nine books, then you have a five ninety nine book for them. If they're only willing to try a free book for the first time, then you've got a free book for them. Once you get them into your stable, once they experience your writing, once you earn their trust as a reader, then that that the that pricing bias evaporates. Um, and and so I, I think this is an exciting opportunity for a lot of authors, you know, maybe authors that are only occupying a single price point or a narrow band is to, you know, to look at the list and look at opportunities to have a, you know, at least one book at free, a book at 99 cents, 299, 399, and then some higher price books and higher price standalone books too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I guess I inadvertently do that because I like the free series starter. But if something's a standalone book, I was, well, I'm just gonna make that 495 because uh, it's not leading into anything else. And probably maybe only the true fans will get it. But uh, maybe somebody that likes that higher price point might just pick it sure. up. Sure. Yeah, one of our um, one of our best selling indie authors during this 12 month survey period was price was pricing um, at 999 full length fiction. Um, a series of uh, two or three books. He had two books out and another book on pre-order. The series starter was at nine ninety nine. So he's breaking all the rules and doing really well. It, you know, I, I would really, you know, when when authors are looking at the Smashwords survey, and I, I warn about this throughout and in the blog post and on the podcast, um, numbers are dangerous, and just because you know the average author will have the, t the average experience at these different price points doesn't mean that your book is going to conform to this experience. So you just want to use this as a, a you know, a data point. Like, you know, I, I can tell just about any author with confidence, if you write full length fiction and all your books are at 199, if you move up to 299 or 399, you're going to see your unit sales increase. I mean, the, the data is pretty strong about that. I don't know why, but it's been that way for six years. Readers hate 199. It's an interesting topic. I now <laughs> I know that from listening to you, and every time I see a book bub ad for like a, it's usually traditionally published books that are a dollar ninety nine. I'm like, oh, I wonder if that'll work or if, <laughs> if they'll be turned off. It, it, you know, it's a good question, and maybe there. Are, and, and just because the data shows that 199 tends to be a black hole, doesn't you know? It might still work for a BookBub ad. You know, maybe BookBub is its own universe. It could be. They're large enough to, <laughs> to be a small galaxy. And, anyway. and, and and the reader is seeing that the that it's normally a 599 book or a 799 book that they're getting for 199. So then the 199 probably doesn't carry a lot of the same negative bias that a book that's regularly priced at 199 would be. Right, well, we've got three questions from Twitter to wrap things up with okay. here. Uh, Hal would like to know which of the larger platforms Smashwords distributes to have, more, have readers which show more traction or interest for science fiction adventure books? Yes, that was his uh, genre specifically, but uh, for sci-fi and fantasy, is there any of the platforms that do better than others? Well, uh, I would say iBooks. Um, iBooks does an amazing job of supporting writers. They do a, an amazing job of supporting free series starters. So if you're writing series in any, in any subgenre, sci-fi and fantasy, um, you know, they, they actively promote uh, free series starters. And if you look at the list, you're going to see a lot of Smashwords authors, including a couple authors on this podcast that regularly get amazing merchandising just because they have a free series starter. Um, so, th so they do well. You know, my, the, my quick number crunching today um, didn't show a lot of optimism in general for sci-fi adventure, um, but I wouldn't want anyone to be discouraged by that. You know, it's possible that, you know, the readers just haven't discovered his book yet. It only takes a, a couple best-selling authors to skew all the results. Maybe there's just not anybody out there selling sci-fi adventure that uh, has met the demands of the audience that's looking for Hal's particular series. Yeah. So, Hal, you go for it. <laughs> yeah, go for it. 
And uh, he had another question. If an author's coming out of Kindle Unlimited and hoping to launch their series uh, wide, maybe they have a three or five book series, and they've got a $500 budget, um, what, what is, how should they use that money to get the most bang for their buck? And it sounds like iTunes is a good platform to target maybe for sci-fi, but just in general, what's the best use of it? Well, $500 isn't a lot for a marketing budget. Um, and and I, I can't claim to be an expert on paid advertising. You know, generally, like in my, in my book, the Smashwords Book Marketing Guide, um, I focus on free marketing opportunities. Um, I, is this coming from Hal still? Um, this is Hal looking to sell his sci-fi Hal. adventures. Okay. <laughs> Hal, yeah, Hal, I, I would recommend um, that with $500, there, there are a lot of things that you can do for free to, to maximize the virality of your book, to make it more accessible, more enjoyable, uh, more shareable uh, for readers. And, and a lot of that has, to, a lot of these things fall under what I would call autopilot marketing. So things that you can do to the interior of your book to help you sell more books. So for example, uh, in your back matter, at the end of the book, after the end, you should have links. You should, you should list all your other books that you have available. You should, have a, uh, you should list the books that you have on pre-order, list samples of your books on pre-order that are coming out, um, list your social media coordinates so, it, so readers can start following you with a click, uh, a link to your private mailing list so you can capture that book. Uh, make sure one of your books is free. Um, I think free is still one of the most powerful marketing tools for authors, um, especially in this category of autopilot marketing, uh, free books on average get about 30, 33 times more downloads than a book at any other price. So a free book can be the magnet that drives books into your series. So definitely price the free series starter, at, uh, the series starter at free. Um, just looking at our top 10 best-selling sci-fi titles during this 12-month period, seven out of those 10, uh, when I look at the, the 10 best-selling series, seven of the top 10 had a free series starter. And when we start looking at the poorer selling series, the incidence of the free series starter drops. So that, that's kind of a no brainer. Uh, price the first book at free. And because you're going wide, uh, you can price at free. Uh, you don't just have to put up with five days per quarter of free. You can have perma free. So do that. I think that'll be a lot more effective than spending your $500 uh, anywhere else. Um, Listen to the Smart Author Podcast. Sorry for the plug, uh, but, but it, I'm right now getting close to wrapping up the serialization of the new 2018 edition of the Smashwords Book Marketing Guide. And I talk about a lot of these things that you can do for free. Um, and then beyond that, you know, in terms of advertising, I continue to hear just wonderful things about BookBub. So, you know, try to get a BookBub ad. Uh, I, I don't know that I've spoken to any authors that were disappointed by their performance there. Yeah, it was the first thing I was thinking of, because we didn't talk about it today, but I know you said that Permafree Book One was still a really good way to, to get readers. And uh, there was actually a post that David Gogren did mentioning that the folks that go wide often do more of a drip marketing campaign rather than a big blast of let's spend $2,000 or $500 all at once. So. It sounds like what you're saying would match up perfectly with that. Maybe just get a little ad here and there and whenever you can on that free book one. Yeah. You know, I, I think, um, you know, a lot of authors make the mistake of focusing all of their marketing and promotion around the book launch and not maintaining some kind of ongoing effort. I think the ongoing effort is really important. You know, in my former life, before I started Smashwords, I ran a PR agency. And, uh, you know, we learned very quickly that, you know, if we had a client who came along who just wanted to spend $30,000 to do a launch of a product and then nothing to sustain it, those clients failed. But the clients who came on, came along with a much more modest budget that was sustained over time, um, really had a, a greater opportunity to build, build the brands and get positive attention. And I think the same is, is true for authors. You should always be out there doing something you know, interested, interesting and creative to, to maintain uh, the, the attention of your readers. 
All right, great. One final question for you from Dale. Aside from coupons and linking to your books on Smashwords, what are your tips for selling more books at the Smashwords store? If you have access to your readers, like through a private mailing list, um, then I, I think coupons are a great way to do it. Do a special deal uh, for your readers at the Smashwords store. Um, you know, one of, one of the, the neat features that we came out with in 2017 with the coupons is that when you're creating a coupon, you can create either a public, you can make it either public or private. A private coupon, uh, you control who the coupon code goes to. And if you make it a public coupon now, it's automatically enrolled uh, in our special deals promotion, which is an ongoing live promotion every day on the Smashwords homepage. Um, so, you know, experiment with that. Um, experiment with special deals and then I just also just to set expectations uh, the Smashwords store you know, it, it's interesting it was a bright spot in our business in 2018 uh, our sales in 2017 grew over 2016 for our tiny little Smashwords store um, so you know we'll be doing more with the store in the future uh, there's a lot of opportunity and it does pay the highest royalty rates anywhere up to 80% list um, but, you know, offer a special deal to the, re the readers, point them with a direct hyperlink to the book page that you have on sale and promote it that way. But don't neglect the other retailers. You know, make sure that on your website, you're linking to all the other retailers as well. All right. Well, thank you for all the great information today. That wraps things up for us. Uh, we will link to your new podcast and the survey data in case people want to you know, hop in there and look for themselves. This is uh, episode 166 on marketingsff.com if people need to come and get any of the links. But do you want to mention anything else or just let people know where they can find you? Um, well, you can find me um, at Smashwords. You can find me on Twitter at Mark Coker, M-A-R-K-C-O-K-E-R. -E I'm on Facebook, Mark Coker. You can find the Smart Author Podcast at smashwords.com forward slash podcast or anywhere find podcasts are found. Um, and if you want to email me, you can email me at mc at smashwords.com. So I'd be happy to try to point you in the right direction. And uh, thanks, you guys. It's been great being on your show again. Um, do it again sometime. Hey, we appreciate you actually taking time off your Hawaiian vacation to come chat with us. <laughs> Can't My say pleasure. I do the same. <laughs> oh, well, I... I I, I, I enjoyed uh, being on your show a couple of years ago and, and uh, like to support it and support you guys. And I'm honored to be here. We so appreciate thanks. it. We appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening. All right. So long Peace. everybody. Take it easy.